Good afternoon. My name is David Greenfield. I'm the councilman from the 44th District in Brooklyn. I'm privileged to serve as the chair of the Land Use Committee. I want to apologize that we started a little bit late today. We had an unanticipated stated meeting to deal with several items that were sent to us by the state in the form of home rules. I want to recognize my colleagues who are joining us here today, Councilmember Mendez, Councilmember Rodriguez, Councilmember Lander, Councilmember Wills, Councilmember Kalos, Councilmember Palma, and Chair Salamanca. And also, of course, <coughs> we want to welcome Councilmember Margaret Chin, who is the sponsor of the legislation that we are reviewing today. At the Land Use Committee, we rarely do hearings on legislation. Our focus is on the review of land use changes across the city, from large rezonings to the designation of historic districts, to HPD applications, to build affordable housing, to so the locations of new schools, to the sale of city-owned land, and the list goes on and on and on. And rest assured, those responsibilities keep us very busy. But over the past three years, it has been my policy as chair that when there is an issue that we need to look at more carefully and when we have seen limited progress on a particular issue, we have decided to focus on that issue. For example, we reformed the Landmarks Review process, which was a difficult but important discussion to ensure that the public and elected officials have a clear understanding of how long it would take for the Landmarks Preservation Commission and the Council to make a decision. Under a law that was co-authored by Landmarks Chair Peter Ku and myself and heard in this committee, Landmarks Preservation Commission was required to go through its backlog and make final recommendations on calendared properties Legislation intro 775A also ensures that there will never be a backlog again because designations must be made within one year of calendaring for individual properties or two years for historic districts. This legislation has been incredibly successful and in fact, to the credit of the Landmarks Preservation Commission, they actually reached the finality of the backlog before our deadline and they have told us consistently that they're able to meet both deadlines, the one year for individual properties and two years for historic districts. We've also crafted legislation to radically improve our oversight of public spaces which are privately owned, but where all too often property owners have failed to live up to their end of the bargain. <clears throat> we hope to have that legislation passed soon. Today's hearing is a continuation of this commitment to oversight and to ensuring that the public understands and has access to the critical information that shaped their neighborhoods. Our hope is that an informed public will only make for better planning outcomes. This is a basic premise that we in the Council believe strongly, but unfortunately has not always been shared. So today, we bring that principle to a discussion of the herbal renewal and its legacy in New York City. Like many of the big planning conversations in New York City, we're wrestling with the ghost of Robert Moses here as well. First, a very brief and simple overview. To take advantage of state and federal subsidies for urban development, the city of New York under Robert Moses began to designate vast swaths of the city as urban renewal areas. An urban renewal area is an area of the city that has been designated by the City Planning Commission and the Council as appropriate for urban renewal because it has deteriorated or has a blighting influence. In these areas, cities are authorized to clear and acquire property by condemnation and other means and to dispose of the property to a developer. One of the revealing area case studies in our committee report is an urban renewal area in Councilmember Chin's district along the Manhattan waterfront between the Manhattan and Williamsburg bridges. This neighborhood, known as Two Bridges, was the location of an urban renewal plan adopted back in 1967. The purpose of this plan was to limit density, promote the construction of low and moderate income housing, ensure adequate open space and lighted air, among other goals. The urban renewal plan expired in 2007, and with it went critical restrictions on the property, including restrictions on how much could be built. So today, this community is on the verge of a profound transformation. Literally, three towers close to 1,000 foot tall are being proposed in a neighborhood of primarily 100 to 200 feet towers, including 2,775 new dwelling units, which doesn't include another 815 units, which are as of right. <clears throat> the Department of City Planning has concluded this change to the plans, which have significant impacts, is only, quote, unquote, a minor modification, not requiring council review, despite Councilmember Chin's strenuous objections. We actually agree with the council member. And the reason we agree is because essentially what's happening over here is that based on a plan that was originally adopted in 1967, we're now taking actions that nobody could have foreseen 50 years later where a neighborhood has completely changed and we're about to change the face of this neighborhood without any significant public input. 
We might not be facing this unfortunate situation if, before the plan expired, the community and elected officials were aware of the contents and importance of the herbal renewal plan. This information could have, have a profound implications for the proposals we see today, and that is the point of this legislation. To ensure that there is transparency and the public can access urban renewal plans and advocate for them to remain in place or to ensure that the zoning is updated when a plan expires to maintain key provisions. If we are going to grow as a city, we're going to need to build trust with communities, and a key part of that is access to information. We'll also explore today in our Q&A with the Department of City Planning, who has so graciously agreed to attend, the question as to what is, in fact, a minor modification, and how do we define that, and how can something that has such a large impact in the form of thousands of units that will literally change the shape of a neighborhood be considered a minor modification as well? And we're going to do that with the eye towards potentially revising this bill down the road in an A version. I want to thank the co-sponsors, Councilmember Chen, Councilmember Rosenthal, and Councilmember Reynoso, who are all waging tirelessly to ensure that in the midst of this regulatory complexity, the needs of the community are not forgotten for highlighting this issue for us today. I'd also like to thank our outstanding land use staff for their hard work in preparing for today's hearing, including Raju Mann, Amy Levitan, Julie Lubin, Jeff Campagna, Dylan Casey, and Liz Lee. And I also want to thank my own counsel, Elena Sitcheva, for the extensive preparation that has gone into this hearing. With that, I'm happy to turn it to Councilmember Chin if she'd like to make some opening remarks as well. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Councilmember Margaret Chin, and I want to thank Chair Greenfield and the Land Use Committee for this opportunity to hear testimony and public comments on Intro 1533, a bill requiring notification and information about urban renewal areas that will create additional transparency in the land use process. In 1961, New York City designated 14 acres along the East River in my district as the Two Bridges Urban Renewal Area and adopted the Urban Renewal Plan in 1967. The plan imposed land use controls that were more restrictive than the underlying zoning. For example, certain parcel land had four area caps. When the urban renewal area expired, the protection of this plan expired as well. Without these protection, the underlying C6-4 zoning, the highest density in the city, allowed developers to build slender, taller buildings in a neighborhood of modest 20 and 30-story 30, 30 middle-income and low-income housing. We lost these protections in a time when any empty land seems to go to the highest bidder and the most luxurious projects. In 2007, a plan to extend the urban renewal area was mysteriously withdrawn without community input, allowing it to expire. That same year, neighbors began hearing rumors that the site of the Pathmark supermarket was being targeted for luxury condo. These speculation created even greater development pressure. Within a few years, it had been purchased by one of the largest developers in the city. Extel's project, an old 421A with luxury condo and a poor building, is rising on this site. The building, as of right, without the urban renewal area or some other zoning change, wreak havoc on a community already under siege from overzealous developers. It caused structural damage to the streets and neighboring buildings, and Con Ed is currently suing the developer for damage to their critical infrastructure. Now, three other different development proposals seeks to generate nearly 3,000 units of housing, changing this neighborhood forever. Unfortunately, the underlying zoning allows these humongous towers, and these buildings are within the so-called letter of the law, but do not represent either the spirit or the intent of the urban renewal plan to create safe, affordable housing in this neighborhood. We need more public input on land use decision, not less. We ask for a EULA process in the Two Bridges area to ensure that all voices are heard, but the Department of City Planning said no to us. So with intro 1533, we could have had an opportunity to prevent these humongous development. If in 2007, the community had the information 
that this bill requires, we could have come together and fought back. We could have pushed harder to extend the protection in the urban renewal plan. We could have had a tool to try to stop projects like Excel. And knowing a little bit of transparency and notification could have prevented this nightmare in the Two Bridges area. Frankly, make me sick to my stomach every time I see um, the picture of these big towers. But I hope this will never happen again to any other community across the city. If passed, Intro 1533 can empower communities all over the city with vital information so they can proactively advocate for sensible development, unlike the proposal right now that's happening in the Two Bridges area. I want to thank Chair Greenfield for holding this important hearing, and I also want to thank the staff who work on this legislation, uh, Raju Mann, Julie Lubin, and Jeffrey Campagna. I look forward to hearing testimony from HPD and advocates from across the city. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just want to recognize that we've also been joined by Council Member Koo, Chair Koo, Council Member Mealy, Chair Richards, and Council Member Levin. And seeing that there are no of the other co sponsors who'd like to make any opening remarks, I will turn it over to the Department of Housing and Preservation and Development to make some remarks of their own. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Chairman Greenfield and members of the Land Use Committee. My name is Eunice Su, and I am the Assistant Commissioner of Planning and Pre-Development at the Department of Housing Preservation and Development. I'm joined by Jordan Press, the Executive Director for Development and Planning in HPD's Government Affairs Unit, Joel Kolkman, Team Leader at the Manhattan Department of City Planning, and Eric Bots Boxford at the end, Deputy Director of um, Manhattan Department of City Planning. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I, I oh, apologize. We, yes. Because we do these infrequently, we haven't updated our uh, normal rules, which are okay. we need to <laughs> pause for a moment and ask you to please raise your right hand and respond. Do you affirm or swear that everything that you say today in your testimony and your answers to your questions will, in fact, be truthful? I do. Thank you. That's for the entire panel. I do. Thank you very much. You may continue. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify at this hearing on Intro 50, uh, 1533, which would require HPD to notify relevant community boards, borough presidents, and council members when an urban renewal plan expires. In addition, the bill would require HPD to post online information about the status of urban renewal plans, including any approved or pending extensions of expiration dates. Urban renewal began in the late 1940s as a centralized, federally assisted program and evolved over several decades into a decentralized amalgam of mostly locally funded programs to preserve and redevelop existing communities. At one time, there were approximately 150 urban renewal areas in the city, ranging in size from one block to several hundred blocks. Approximately 60 of these plans remain in effect today. Much of the property acquisition occurred in the late 1960s and early 1970s, when federal and state urban renewal funding was at its height. The city continues to work on the redevelopment of some of these properties and on a much smaller scale still acquires new properties for redevelopment. The state urban renewal law defines urban renewal as a program established, conducted, and planned by a municipality for the redevelopment of substandard and insanitary areas. The same law establishes approval processes for the designation of the urban renewal area, approval of the, of the plan, and the acquisition of property. In addition, the city charter requires ULERT for approval of the plan and the acquisitions made pursuant to the plan. In practice, the approvals required pursuant to the urban renewal law are virtually always granted simultaneously with the approvals under the ULERT process. In New York City, the actions and approvals required by the urban renewal law are performed or granted by HPD, the City Planning Commission, the City Council, and the Mayor. The council plays a pivotal role in both the designation of urban renewal areas and the approval of urban renewal plans. Neither an urban renewal area nor a plan can be created or changed without council approval. An urban renewal project involves the following six steps. One, designation as an urban renewal area. 
the municipality determines that an area contains substandard conditions that are appropriate for urban renewal and designates it for renewal. The properties designated for redevelopment constitute an urban renewal area. Two, urban renewal plan. The municipality in our case is HPD acting on behalf of the city, prepares the plan for the redevelopment of the area. It includes among other things, a statement of proposed land uses, acquisition, demo demolition, methods of renewal, public or community facilities, and the time schedule for implementation. Three, acquisition. The municipality acquires the sites that are designated for renewal. Four, site preparation. After acquisition, the municipality may relocate any residents and businesses that will, be, that will be displaced by the renewal activities. It may also perform demolition on sites slated for new construction or open space. The five, disposition. The municipality sells the site to a private sponsor. And the last step, uh, step six, is redevelopment. The sponsor redevelops the site in accordance with the plan. After holding a public hearing, the council votes to designate the area and finds that it is appropriate for urban renewal. The area is composed entirely of the sites specifically designated and targeted in the plan for acquisition and redevelopment. There may be other properties within the boundary of the area which have not been designated as renewal sites. But these properties are not part of the area and are exempt from the controls of the plan. Even if they are subsequently acquired by the city by other means, they do not automatically become part of the area and are not subject to the plan. They are treated like any other city-owned property unless and until the area designation and plan are specifically amended to include them as urban renewal sites with the council's approval. The plan establishes how every designated site will be redeveloped and used after acquisition, but has no effect on the property until and unless it is acquired by the city. Unlike the zoning resolution, a plan cannot impose land use controls on privately owned property in the area. The urban renewal law simply off, off, gives the city authority to buy the property and then resell it to redevelopers who voluntarily agree as a condition of the sale to comply with the plan. The property is bounded by the version of the plan in effect when the city sells the property to the developer. The deed or the land disposition agreement will contain a covenant requiring the developer to develop and use the property in compliance with the version of the plan then in effect, and will actually include that plan as an exhibit. It is important to note that once the property is sold, there is a contractual relationship between the city and the new property owner. Neither the city nor the property owner may change the terms of the disposition without mutual consent. For any urban renewal property that the city sells, both the covenant and the plan pursuant to which the city sold the property can be found online using the city register's ACRIS system. If the city subsequently amends the plan, the changes in that amendment will not apply to any property that has already been sold unless both the owner and HPD enter into a new agreement specifically providing that amended plan will apply to the property. HPD appreciates the council's interest in making more information about urban renewal plans easily accessible to the public. HPD shares the sponsor's goal of increasing the transparency of the urban renewal process. Before addressing specific items in the legislation, HPD would like to re reiterate that when a property is conveyed by the city to a private sponsor pursuant to an urban renewal plan, a covenant is placed on the property requiring it to adhere to the plan in effect at the time it was conveyed. In this way, current urban renewal plans are useful in determining which restrictions will be placed on applicable sites to be conveyed in the future, but would not affect properties that have already been conveyed. Regarding the specific provisions of intro 1533, HPD is supportive of notifying the affected borough president, council member, and community board when a plan is expiring. However, we suggest amending the window for notification to provide an earlier notice. It takes many months to complete work to amend or extend a plan, and it will be more useful to, for communities to learn about its expiration earlier. As discussed, HPD shares the goal of increasing tra transparency of the urban renewal process. HPD is willing to provide an online database that catalogs the city's urban renewal plans and specifies which are still active and their future expiration dates. We have some concerns with the way the bill is currently drafted and the data points it would require, and we look forward to discussing amendments to the bill with the sponsor. It is important that we balance the need for transparency with making sure that information is provided in the most useful way possible and that the compiling and posting of data is not excessively resource intensive. 
Thank you for the opportunity to testify. We look forward to working on amendments to this bill with the sponsor, and we are happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Councilmember Chin, who can uh, start us off with some questions, and I'll take questions after her. Thank you, Councilmember. Um, thank you, Chair. And thank you for your testimony. Can you give us some historic perspective? Um, why was the Two Bridges uh, Urban Renewal Area created? Uh, what, can you give us some background history in terms I'm, of the, uh, the, the goal, the purpose, the principle? Sure. As discussed, the goals of the Urban Renewal Plan initially was to remove blight and substandard conditions from an area. There are urban rural plans in all five boroughs throughout the city. They were created mostly in the 1960s and 1970s, so they did start in the 1940s, and at the time of its creation, um, this was selected as a potential urban renewal area and plan. Do you remember how tall the buildings in that area were? And at which point? Um, when the plan was uh, being uh, designated at that time. They were mainly tenement buildings, right? Honestly, Council Member, I, I don't think we know the heights of the building, or don't currently know the heights of the buildings at the time that the plan. Okay, I think some of the residents who were in the neighborhood um, sort of remember that it, what that area looked like, and also the, the building that were built after the plan was designated. I mean, we have Project Bay Section 8 buildings there, uh, we have Mitchell Lama building, but they all were like relatively. I mean, the height was like 20, 20 story, 20 some story, the highest. Um, so there were a certain restriction that was put in place. And do you know what uh, planning principle were the basis of the, the floor area cap and the height limit um, that were put on some of the site by the plan? There must have been some reason, right? I think it's a little challenging for us to speak to the plan at the point of its creation in, ni in the 1960s. But, yeah. You can't answer that, why there were restriction that, and protection that was put in place? I mean, there must be some reason for it, right? That all the buildings there is pretty much about the same height. Um, there were public housing buildings and the project base um, Section 8 building that was built, a senior housing was built, um, all yeah. the housing that was built, and then they have some low, um, the, the townhouse was only like two story high. Right. And all of a sudden now, when the plan expired, now we got these like humongous monstrosity. It's like, what happened? You know? Right. So, um, to your earlier question, it's uh, reasonable to assume, and while we weren't involved, obviously, in the process at the time, that <clears throat> issues such as what was contextual to the neighborhood and um, height limits and um, development goals uh, that the community may have had at the time would have been included uh, in the document. Oh, maybe city planning can answer some of that question. Like in terms of from a planning perspective, when the urban renewal plan was instituted, um, there were you know height protection, uh, floor area cap. So there must be some reason for all those protection uh, that was in place. Sure. So I actually just I'm not remembering off the top of my head that there was actually height restrictions. I certainly remember that there were four Sir, I apologize, but can you do you mind stating your name for the record? Oh, sure, of course. Joel Kolkman, uh, City Planning. Thank you. Can you just give us your title and... Oh, sure. Team Leader, Manhattan Office, City Planning. Thanks very much. Of course. So, I, again, I just don't recall off the top of my head if there actually were height restrictions in that urban renewal plan. There were definitely floor area restrictions. You're correct on that front. So, even with those floor area stri restrictions, it would have been possible to have taller buildings than existed um, or than we, that we see in the neighborhood today. And one reason for that may be the construction technology was obviously very different then. Um, it wasn't as easy to construct as tall of a building with the same cost constraints and technology that was available then. That's just one potential possible idea. 
Um, but that's all I have for now. Well, I mean, it's, it's in the right next to the East River, right? And um, in terms of in a flood zone. Um, but it's just interesting that all the building that was built after the urban renewal plan were all about pretty much the same height. Um, the public housing that was further inland and all the, the building that were built, even the, the senior building, I mean, they all was pretty much the same height. That's why it just, it's outrageous. All of a sudden, you know, Excel comes in and they build this, you know, start building this monstrosity and it's as a right. And the thing is like the city, like, maybe just go back a little bit to like, there were, um, there were, uh, uh, there was a suggestion to, or there was an attempt uh, to renew the, the urban renewal uh, plan, but then it was withdrawn. Do you have any um, insight into what happened back then? We, I, we do not have any insight at the moment, but it's certainly something we could look into. Yeah, that's, we'll look into it. Yeah, definitely. What, we would love for you to help us solve that mystery, mm -hmm. like what happened, you know, why was, you know, there was somebody actually was paying attention and was looking at, um, knew that it was expiring, wanted to work on renewing it, and then somehow it was withdrawn. So we definitely want to find out exactly uh, what happened there. Um, Chair, can we ask him, uh, I guess city planning, to sort of explain, you mentioned about it earlier in your opening remarks about how they justify that each one of these new development coming in was a minor modification, and how come three minor doesn't add up to a major? I mean, when you look at the picture um, that the developer are showing uh, to DCP, to the community, it just, doesn't make sense at all. Uh, so in terms of city planning, I think one of the things relating to the urban renewal area is that does the city planning come in and kind of like kind of review the area and see what's happening there and see what development is appropriate or not appropriate? Because I don't think that we can just say, hey, is that so right and we can't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. But in terms of overall city planning process, you got to have, you know, recommendation and have a say and have oversight. We just can't let things just do whatever they want or just like everything is as a right and then we, we cannot do anything about it. But in this area where all the buildings are the same height and then all of a sudden you have something that's coming in that's more than double the height, it's just going to change the character of the neighborhood and it's creating um, a lot of havoc there that shouldn't happen. So would you like so, to address so, the... So I'll speak to the, the minor modification versus major modification um, distinction. So as you know, um, this is the former urban renewal area and which has the existing large scale residential development, um, which was a, approved by the commission and is a series of approvals over time to um, allow for certain kinds of development in that area. Um, so when, when we... When, when were those approvals? Um, starting from seven, roughly 1972 to 95. Okay, thank you. Um, over, you know, multiple times. So the, the difference here is when we, when we have a new, when there's a proposal for a change to a large scale or a new development in a large scale, we look at it and say, okay, is there, there's two ways. There's the ma minor mod or major mod. And if the proposal is compliant with the underlying zoning and does not increase the extent of any previously approved waivers that were approved on the sites, in this case from 1972 to approximately 1995, then that would be a minor modification which would require for the site plan to be updated, for the zoning analysis of the entire large scale to be updated to reflect that new development. However, if the proposal was, did require new waivers, whether it be, um, you know, height and setback or, you know, distance between buildings, which was an example of a previous approval within this large scale, then a major modification would be required. Um, and, of course, that would trigger the full Euler review here. Um, is there another part to the, 
to the question. Let me make sure I answer. You know, Councilmember Chen, I think I think you tagged me, so you asked me to jump in for a second. So is that okay? I'm going to jump in to follow up on some of the questions. I'm going to bring it back to you, just to just to uh, fine tune fine tune this point. So let's just. I think we jumped into the weeds. So let's just take a little bit of a step back. So when this plan was originally was originally created some 50 years ago, did this plan contemplate the current developments that we are seeing, specifically um, the projects by JDS, LNM, and Starrett totaling an additional two and a half million square feet of residential and other square footage as well? The plan, the plan at the time. So it's simply yes or no question. That's right. Yes, at the time. When the, when the, no, no, they certainly did not. They, they certainly did not. Okay, they, very good. So this was. So I think that's really what we're getting at over here. So let's just step back a second. When this urban renewal plan was created, it was created for a certain purpose. That purpose was met. The transfer of property took place. Those developments took place. In fact, there was a planning rationale at the time. I imagine, right? The same Department of City Planning was involved today. I'm not sure that you actually have anyone there from 1967. It'd be interesting. Factoid, Joel, do you know if anyone is still there from 1967? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Get back to me on that one. Maybe we can bring that uh, individual in and they might be able to shed some light on it. But I would imagine that when the plan was contemplated, there was a very specific plan, and that plan essentially was achieved. Right? Do we agree with that? That that plan that was originally contemplated originally back in 1967, which was the action for this urban renewal to clear the blight and to beef up this neighborhood and to make it nice again, that plan was successful, check, mission accomplished. Yes, Jordan, is that a fair yes. statement? Yes. Very good. Okay. So the question I believe that we're asking is that it would seem to us, and I think this is where we're going to dig in a little bit on the definition of the minor mod, and as I said before, we are reserving the right to tweak this legislation to also explore whether we should tweak the definition of minor mod versus major mod. So maybe you can help us do that here today. And so I think our, our curiosity is, so there was a plan that nobody contemplated were, would result in essentially three, three skyscrapers. And now the community wakes up and they're finding out that there's going to be two and a half million new square feet of residential, tens of thousands of square feet of uh, community facility, accessory parking, and other sorts of things, nearly 3,000 units of housing. So the council member says, regardless of what, how you define minor mod or major mod, this to me would seem like a major modification of the original plan going back to 1965. Now, logic would argue, logic would argue that this is a pretty big modification, right? If originally we intended on having a community and that community is now fully developed, and then suddenly a few years ago, out of left field, poof, we're now dropping an extra two and a half million square feet of space, nearly 3,000 units, without any sort of review or any sort of context, or any sort of planning rationale, or any conversation about the impact it's going to have on the community, including the infrastructure, environmental impact, potential things like schools, traffic, parking, the list goes on and on, not to mention lack of affordable housing. It certainly would seem to us, as folks who are not as expert as you are, obviously, as the experts that are here on our panel at HPD and DCP, it would seem to us like that is a quote-unquote major modification, as opposed to a quote-unquote minor modification. So we ask you, why did you decide to designate this as a minor modification? And did you have the ability or the discretion to choose it as a major modification, but did you choose to de decide it as a minor modification instead? That is the question. Councilmember Chin, does that sound about right? Yes. Thank you. Don't everyone answer at once. Thank <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, you just, are? to state my name for the record, I'm Eric Botsford, Deputy Director of the Manhattan Office at the Department of City Planning. Um, so just to, to address your, your comments and questions, Council Member, I, I think clearly we, we understand the, you know, the, the level of community concern around the size of these, of these developments. and that to you know, many people in the community these do not seem to be minor and it's perhaps an unfortunate term of planning process nomenclature that these are termed minor modifications. But we looked very carefully at the three proposals that were before us to modify the large scale residential development plan. That is what is currently in effect today is this large scale residential development plan. 
and the extent of the modification to that plan that was necessary um, for these developments to take place. And um, as my colleague Joel described, the level of modification to the plan was such that the, the plan that's in effect today does not specify um, height limits, for example, uh, for, for buildings in the large-scale residential development. Um, and does not contain um, very much specificity, actually, regarding developments um, that can take place um, other than uh, uh, the site plan for individual developments. So the types of changes necessary to the large scale for these three developments were indeed determined to be minor when we took a look at them, and, um, and therefore the, uh, they do not warrant a full Euler process. So the types, um, I just want to, I just want to be clear, the types of changes you're saying, meaning the, the technicality of the changes that were being requested in the large scale special permit, right, which is the application before you, you believe that those changes, the technical changes were minor. Can you, can you drill in a little bit and explain to us why you felt those were minor modifications? Mm -hmm. Well, as, as Joel described, um, it, if these were to be considered major modifications, for example, they would need, they would necessitate, they would be the types of changes that would necessitate additional waivers, waivers beyond what were initially considered and approved by the Sitting Planning Commission when the large-scale residential development was, was approved. And um, this large-scale residential development does not contain those types of provisions. Um, therefore, um, modifications, uh, to the site plan, for example, um, uh, do not result in waivers beyond or, uh, or considerations beyond what was originally made when the large scale was approved. Therefore, these are, these are minor. It's a, it's a very detailed technical parsing of, of uh, um, what led to our determination, but we did look at this very carefully and, and you know, we, we believed and continue to believe that these are indeed minor modifications. I will say to address Councilmember Greenfield's comments about the potential for environmental effects here, that one thing that we were very uh, conscientious of is that the environmental considerations be um, very carefully analyzed. We, um, we asked the three separate developers to participate in a coordinated and joint environmental review which they are undertaking, and it's in process right now. Um, and this type of joint and coordinated environmental review for three separate projects undertaken by three separate private applicants is um, an unusual and, 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 you know, we think quite important uh, component of these actions here to ensure that the, uh, any potential environmental effects are considered for all three applications simultaneously that the cumulative effects of these are taken into consideration and that the local community has the opportunity to review the scope of the environmental analysis for all three projects and to provide comment um, on, the, uh, on the three projects through the environmental impact uh, statement process. Comments that you may or may not listen to? We listen to all comments that come well, from you may, the public. I'm sorry, that you may process. or may not act on, just to be clear. Certainly you will listen to the comments, but unlike the Euler process, which would in fact give the local community a formal say, this would not give the local community a formal say. Is that correct? Well, the, com the community has a formal role in the process in participating It's a formal role, but there's no finality of an, the council or an individual council member being able to object as we would have with the traditional Euler process. Essentially, you're taking the feedback, which is appreciated, but you don't necessarily have to listen to the feedback where it's under traditional Euler, but you would have to listen to the feedback because there would be local approval that would be required by the council member. It's a process that's distinct from the Euler process. I understand. Yes. I just want to clarify for those people who can't sleep at 2 in the morning and are watching this at home later tonight. So um, I hear what you're saying. So is it your contention, I just want to be clear about this because it's a very important point, Eric, is it your contention that you could not, you did not have the ability to designate this as a major modification? Is that your contention? Because this was just a tweak of the site plan as opposed to a zoning waiver? Is that essentially your contention? Yes, that's, I mean, the, that, that was the, the determination that was made um, at the Department of City Planning. Um, that you could not. 
So you're I, you didn't have the option. I, it's a very, the reason I'm asking this point, because Eric, this is a very consequential hearing. I don't think, I don't think folks recognize perhaps what's happening at the hearing, and certainly we're not going to have as many people watching as uh, James Comey was uh, the other week, and I get that. It's not that riveting. But <laughs> we're exploring a piece of legislation. We're also exploring the possibility, based on what you're telling me, of changing the definition of minor modification. Because if, in fact, what you're saying is that you had no choice, and you were essentially handcuffed, right, and you had to change this as a minor modification, it is certainly the view of uh, this committee that that is a problem, and therefore there must be a flaw in the definition of the minor mod modification, and therefore we would, that would necessitate a change in how we define minor modification, because we would view this as a major modification, so apparently the law is flawed. And so it's a very big distinction over here, Eric, as to whether or not you believe that you have no option, in which case I certainly respect that, and then it's not your problem. You have no option. We did the best that we could over here, and then we will uh, get back to you with some amendments that refer to how we plan on changing the law in the future so that you do have more options, or whether you chose instead that you wanted to go from, uh, you could have had the option of doing major or minor, and you simply said, okay, hey, you know what, we're going to do we're going to do minor. So which one is it? Is it the former, where you have no choice, or is it the latter, where you could pick A and B and you just decided to pick B? It, it, was, it was not a, a, a choice that was made to pursue one or the other. We undertook it after a very careful review together with DCP counsel, and, uh, and, and the determination was made that these were indeed minor modifications. So, but it was, it was not, a, it was not a, a, a choice which was made to pursue one or over the other simply for expediency, for example. And, and Mr. Chairman, if, if I may, I just want to make sure that we're clear since the legislation is referring to urban renewal plans, right, that the minor modification or major modification as we're discussing would relate to the large scale plan, a different, uh, a different land use matter. Um, and that with respect to these properties and, and their disposition and any changes that might occur to the urban renewal plan, I just want to be, uh, reiterate a point that we made in, in our testimony, which is that there's a covenant signed when these properties were disposed of pursuant to the urban renewal plan and the owner of the property is required to adhere to the covenant and to the urban renewal plan at that time and the expiration of that urban renewal plan, you know, had, and, and while we fully support the, uh, the goal and, and thank the council member for suggesting uh, the idea of notifying the public about the expiration so that they can act appropriately, we think that's appropriate, um, that even if the plan, even if the urban renewal plan had been extended, that that would not impact the covenant of the property uh, that was disposed of at the time and that is, now at question. No, we appreciate that. I think, I think Jordan, you've been to this committee enough to know by now that we try to explore issues in depth, right? And so what we're saying over here today is that if this, if, if in fact what you're stating is correct, that this legislation won't solve our problem, then the answer is we need to amend the legislation in order to solve our problem. So this is why this is helpful. We're, we're uh, discussing an area of the law that doesn't usually get the light of day, and as I said, isn't as glamorous as some other hearings, but this may in fact lead us to come back and to amend this legislation and to say, okay, the problem over here is that the minor modifications in fact are not minor. They're minor from a technical perspective, but the aspect that they have are major, and that seems to be uh, a, leg a legitimate issue. I mean, w would you, would, would anybody uh, care to agree with my assessment and assessment of Councilman Burchin, or disagree perhaps, or state what your opinion is on our assessment, which is that these are major changes, even though technically, from a legal perspective, they may be minor modifications, it's major changes to the site plan that are having a significant impact, the kind of changes that would normally be done in a rezoning. I would say that the, the, we've made the assessment that these are minor modifications to the large-scale plan pursuant to zoning that is existing on the site today. Eric, I've, I've conceded the point to you. I, I trust you and I believe you that you did this in good faith. That's great. My question is this, because you did it based on the law that exists. My question is, would you agree as a planner you and Joel are planners. I don't know if you, Eunice and Jordan are planners or not. Are you guys planners, for chance? You are. Excellent. This is my lucky day. I have three <laughs> out of four planners. Jordan, why do we even have you up there? You're not a planner. To respond to your humorous... Uh, oh, okay. Fair enough. In any event... <laughs> um, <laughs> So as planners, from a planning perspective, let's put aside the issue of, of the technical law over major versus minor modification. 
Would you say this is a major change to the original proposed plans for this urban renewal area as a planning perspective? I'll put aside the technicality. Would you like to opine on that? I mean, I think these obviously are large buildings and they are, are going to bring a lot of different things to the neighborhood. And that's exactly why the three developers are working together to undergo the cumulative environmental impact statement process which is the more robust um, environmental review process, which has two different public hearings as part of that process. Um, so by the fact that these projects are, again, being reviewed cumulatively on a, together in one single document and undergoing the, the most robust environmental review process um, that, that we have available to us, um, that demonstrates you know, the the significance of these projects. Okay, so you would agree the changes are significant, right? I mean, so obviously they must, they must be significant. They're so significant, as you pointed out, that these three developers who normally hate each other and would never work together and are competitors are working together on the environmental to try to figure out what the uh, impact would be. So you understand the thesis, which is that this appears to us to be a, a major a major change, albeit not necessarily technically a major modification, as opposed to what you folks are saying is a major mo minor modification. So uh, I'm glad that we explored that so that we can take a look at that in terms of amendments on this bill in the future. My question, though, is, follow-up question is, why did you choose to do a rezoning, right? The reality is that the Department of City Planning has that ability. You could have decided, you know what, this is an area where we'd like to see some changes. And, and in fact, there was something similar done. I believe it was in uh, 1995. It wasn't a rezoning, but there was a special permit, an authorization for Site 4B, where you changed the allowable FAR on uh, that particular site, and you chose not to do that for other sites, and that was a full ULERP. So why didn't you take the approach that says, you know what, we hear you, minor, major, you know what we should do over here? We should just rezone this neighborhood. That way we can have full community input, and we can bring people together, and then we can just go through the traditional rezoning process. What, why was that not a consideration from the Department of City Planning? So when we look at rezoning, um, a lot of analysis goes into that, a lot of research, um, but a few key themes are looked at. The, the first is the context of the area, um, and for that context, I think while there is a number of buildings that are you know, around 20, mid-20 stories tall, um, there's also buildings that are two stories tall, two or three stories tall, and obviously now more recently, there are buildings that are buildings being constructed that, constructed that will be um, much taller than that. So, in regards to the context, it's a very varied con it's a varied context um, that that really doesn't lend itself to a single zoning district, a single set of height restrictions. There, the the second point I'll make for Two Bridges specifically is the fact that it's on the waterfront. Um, I'd just say generally, it's the department's position to um, you know to have height and to have density on the waterfront. You know, from, again, our perspective, a taller, skinnier building is, is a better option in terms of shadows and other impacts as compared to a, a smaller building that's a little squatter and will cast a deep, um, a wider shadow. I'm not disagreeing, but couldn't you have achieved that through a rezoning process as well? And isn't it the official policy of the city of New York, the, the mayor and the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, to try to maximize affordable housing? And if you did a rezoning, wouldn't that have necessarily required a mandatory inclusionary housing, which we passed last year, so you would have been able to get more affordability and be able to tailor these buildings exactly to your specific requests and requirements. And Jordan, this is actually why we do have you up here, so feel free to jump in at any time as to why it is that you didn't decide not to maximize the affordable units on this project as well. So, well, just let me go to the MIH, and that was actually the third point. So this is a C64 zoning district, and in order to, um, to map MIH in the area, you need to in have an increase in residential capacity. And the current residential capacity in this area is 12 FAR, and that is the highest maximum residential capacity um, allowed by the state multiple dwelling law. So a rezoning here would actually, you would not be able to get mandatory inclusionary housing in this area, and you would not be able to um, require that affordable housing and mandate that through a rezoning process. Okay, I think we have a disagreement on that based, I'll refer you back to the Adorama project where we have a disagreement over creation of uh, new uh, residential FAR versus the usage of the 
uh, FAR on, on that as well. I mean, Jordan, are you concerned over here in terms of this uh, voluntary inclusionary housing program? The kind of affordability is not the same that we would see under mandatory inclusionary housing, including higher AMIs and less time being locked in in terms of the affordability of those units. I would just the say position of the HPD to let developers skate now and do the least amount of affordable possible? No, uh, so I would just say as a general statement that it is always the interest of, of the agency in furtherance of the Housing New York plan to try to maximize affordable housing whenever possible. So then why not look at it from a rezoning perspective or perhaps a full ULERP where to be perfectly frank, you would have had more leverage from a local council member who I assure you would be much, much, much in favor of more affordability. Council Member Chen, can I refer to you? Would you be in favor of more affordable housing on this particular site? Is that something that you might be in favor of? Yeah, we definitely want more affordable housing, but the monstrosity that's being proposed is way out, way Absolutely. out of scale. So you, and that is not you have a, a council trade member. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly not as uh, inside the inside the room as you folks are, but you've got a council member here who would be very happy to give you more affordable housing. Uh, you've got a chair who's happy to hold hearings. You have a subcommittee chair who loves to hold hearings as well. Let's, uh, let's, do this as a, let's do this as a rezoning. Everybody should come back in here, and uh, HPD will be able to get, I guarantee you, mark my words, you have my personal assurance that we will not pass this project through a ULERP unless we get more affordable housing than we have right now. What, what, what say you, HPD? Sound fair? Let's wrap this up. We'll call it a day. We can gavel out. On, on questions of rezoning in association with our housing projects, we do heavily defer to our friends at the Department of City Planning. I, just to follow on that point, I mean, I, I think that we would, we've, we, we would feel very strongly that MIH is not something that could be implemented here through uh, zoning actions, given that the area is already mapped at the highest density residential capacity that is available to the site. The residential floor area exists on that site today, and zoning actions would not enable any substantial increase in residential capacity, which is a prerequisite for being able to apply MIH uh, in any rezoning scenario. So we do not see a scenario where MIH could be applied here through a rezoning. Okay, final question before I turn it back to Council Member Chen. When you spoke about the environmental concerns, uh, what is being done to mitigate the impact of the increased density, the influx of residents regarding the schools, open spaces, transportation, improvements, all the sorts of things that we would generally consider when there is a rezoning, considering that we didn't actually plan to have these additional nearly 3,000 units in this particular community? So the environmental review process um, just formally begun at the end of May with the scoping public hearing, a scoping meeting, I should say. Um, so that's really just the beginning. So all of those areas that you just mentioned will be analyzed, will be studied, comments from, well, and before that, I should even say, comments at the scoping meeting will be um, addressed and incorporated into the final scope of work. And, um, and again, the, then those areas that you mentioned will be studied and looked at. And if there are impacts, um, mitigations will be assessed as well. Do you plan on having a restrictive declaration to bind them to the mitigation? Um, yeah. I, I, we would need to confer with the City Planning Council. I, I, I don't know off the top of my head if that's the case here. Great. I appreciate your response to the questions. I'm going to the true form of WWE, I'm going to tag Councilmember Chin back to take <laughs> over for follow-up questions. Well, I think my colleague, my co-sponsor, uh, Councilmember Rosenthal, also has some questions. I could defer to her first. Councilmember Rosenthal, would you like to jump in? I, you know, you've basically taken care of the whole thing, as usual, but you spoke so quickly <laughs> that I'm going to say it now just a little bit more slowly so the residents in my district can understand what the issues are. Yeah, us Brooklynites, we're fast speakers and readers, it's true. You are. But we have tolerance for those of you who live in Manhattan, not to worry. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Councilmember Chin and Reynoso, for your leadership on this issue. I'm proud to sponsor and to support this legislation. 
You know, it's just so important that our communities are able to respond in real time when there are land use changes that will affect them. So I think this bill is an important part in making the development process more accountable to the people that we all serve. My district has seen expiration of urban renewal plans lead to developments that members of the community would never have thought possible. Right now, at 200 Amsterdam, we are pushing back against what will be the tallest tower on the Upper West Side, uh, in the middle of what was the Lincoln Square Urban Renewal Plan. That plan expired in the 1990s. No one was paying attention. This developer was collecting air rights. And now we have a luxury, high-rise residential building with zero affordable housing. Um, and it doesn't even have the benefit of MIH. It's going to be 66 stories, twice the height, more than twice the height of the surrounding buildings. So with that in mind, I definitely attach myself to the comments that our chair made, um, that this can't have been what you had in mind when you set the urban renewal plans uh, into, into action. Um, they certainly served a purpose. They certainly worked in my district. But coming out is uh, just a disaster for the community. Um, our development process is supposed to remove the arbitrary decision making and make the future of our neighborhoods more predictable. But unless the community is able to react to the changes like this one in real time, it ends up feeling as arbitrary and unpredictable uh, to our neighbors as anything else. What I don't understand seriously to the city, to, to city planning, is why the rules always seem to be set up in favor of luxury high-rise developers. They always win. And in the 200 Amsterdam situation, we got zero opportunity to review. Not a major, minor, large-scale plan thrust upon the community a 66-story building only because if the deal was done in the middle, in the dark of night. And it's not the dark of night, right? It was 20 years of, you know, the developer always has the advantage. They have the land use lawyers. They were able to fix this and make it, fix it to work for them. They were very aware of the urban renewal process coming to an end, very aware that they could buy the air rights and then use them for a 66-story building, um, completely out of context for the Lincoln Center area, in Lincoln Square, Lincoln Center area. And we have no, we're not even getting affordable housing. I, I don't get it. Well, what's the thinking? Well, I think that at the Department of City Planning, we are always operating in the mindset of MIH now and being able to apply MIH where we can and to maximize the amount of affordable housing that we can produce as a result of, uh, of discretionary actions that are undertaken. Um, you know, as we've said in the context of Two Bridges, the way in which we're able to do that is through applying uh, increases in or approving increases in residential capacity. That's the prerequisite for us to be able to apply MIH um, as part of uh, as part of city that's planning. That's not helping. Approvals. I'm sorry. With all due respect, that's got nothing to do with 200 Amsterdam, which slipped through. No one, you can't tell me that any of you even knew about this property. 
You can't tell me you did, because you don't. I, it's I, not on your radar. Why should it be, right? Because there's nothing in the rules that would make put it on your radar. And once again, the luxury high-rise developers are ripping off the citizens of New York. Answer that question. So, Council Member, if I may, I, I think some of the concerns that, that you've raised, um, and again, there is a challenge with respect to an individual property and how that applies to urban renewal plan, but a lot of the concerns that you've raised are exactly the reason why we think that that the bill that Councilmember Chin has has suggested will be will be helpful, so that the community knows when an urban renewal plan is expiring and can take appropriate action for sites that are uh, have not yet been acquired and disposed of. Well, I'm glad you support the bill, and I'm glad it'll pass very quickly. My concern is this: What are we actually learning from the situation at 200 Amsterdam? And to me, what we're learning is the city is always in a reactive position. And once again, we're reacting, re, you know, being reactive to this situation. Why not use this as an opportunity to reassess the Upper West Side and where we can have more urban renewal planning sites? Or doubling down on the ones that were there and have expired. Let's face it, the ones that were put in on along Amsterdam Avenue and Columbus Avenue between whatever, 88th and 96th, they were huge successes, huge. And now every single one of them are at risk, certainly under a different mayor. You guys are standing tall. Um, supporting the Mitchell Lamas that are there, and I really do appreciate that. But under any other mayor, those would be flipped in a heartbeat. And some of them, as you know, have already been flipped and gone market. So what, given that we have a mayor who believes deeply in affordable housing, what can we do to lay the ground, groundwork today to maintain the affordable housing we have. Could you, would you be willing to do another, I guess it would take a uh, ULERP to reestablish the Upper West Side Urban Renewal Area? That's an area where it's ripe for overdevelopment, ripe. And uh, if we could now do a ULERP, we might be able to prevent, preempt it from happening again. I hear you, we might get some MIH, we might get some affordable housing now, but that's not the point. Um, you know, let's use this opportunity with uh, two bridges, what's happening in Margaret's district, what's happening in mine. I mean, it's outrageous that the people who live in the community wake up and there's a 66-story building going up where none of the buildings around it are 23, but 23 stories. And we get nothing out of it. They're going to bring more kids to PS199, which we're always trying to rezone so it's not overcrowded. Um, no help for the subway at West 72nd Street. I, I just don't understand why this doesn't trigger for you guys an alarm to go back now and reestablish some areas. Why not, right? Do you want to meet on that? I'm up for it. No, we, we would love to. Obviously, every neighborhood and what would be appropriate from a zoning and land use perspective is different for every neighborhood, but we really appreciate this kind of thinking from our partners at the council because it, in, it, it's an aligned thinking really about um, wanting to see affordable housing ma maximized either for new construction or for preservation. And we'd, we'd love to sit down with you more 
whether it's for your neighborhood or, or any member's neighborhood. Great. And talk about how so to start this for an urban renewal, do I start that? Is that a land use thing that you guys initiate in city planning, or does HPD start that? You'd be working with HPD to have okay. those conversations. So I'm free next week. Great. And I would really like to sit down with you and start mapping out sections. Um, you know, we again missed the boat uh, about, I don't know, seven years ago when we down zoned along Broadway between 96 and 110th, again in reaction to two high rises that went up. And, and trust me, that developer, oh, Extel. That developer now has apartments with views that are going to be uh, that are going to earn him millions forever, right? Because we immediately downzoned. So you're welcome, Gary. How come we didn't downzone 96 South to 72nd? We're not Midtown, and now we have a ton of soft spots soft sites that are being built on now so and most of them are doing it without any MIH. We certainly understand and uh, appreciate and also agree with you that we need a comprehensive plan for any neighborhood. In term, I just want to make a distinction between the creation of an urban rural plan and the larger framework of rezoning and zoning districts. With the urban renewal plan um, there may be parameters of you know, as Council Member Chin discussed the FAR. However, the Urban Rural Plan really gives HPD the authority to acquire private sites for in substandard and insanitary areas. So there has, there's a very- Okay, so I gotta tell you, if you want the city council to put more money in the budget for planners and for people in your office, I will fight like a pit bull to get that done. I'm not the expert, you are. You tell me the tools I need to keep these high-rise luxury developers who are getting away with raping the city over and over and over again. We've got a high-rise going up on 66 West 66th Street, 200 Amsterdam, mm -hmm. I, and, and we're getting nothing. Why, where's the rule to fix that? You tell me. I think we should all sit down together with HPD, your office, and city planning as well and have a comprehensive strategic approach. I'd like that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal. I just want to follow up on the, uh, just a point that the Councilmember made. How many urban renewal plans exist that are more restrictive than the underlying zoning? We would have to get back to you on that, that piece. It would require looking through 100 urban rural plans and comparing it to the zoning resolution. Okay, so the question, the question then becomes, can we agree that there are some? Yes. There are some, okay. Well, you certainly would appreciate when you had a chance if you could get back to us on that, preferably in writing. The question that I would have is uh, this then. So, Considering that, that this is an issue, and you see there's a lot of frustration, and I, I want to be clear, we're not trying to blame any agency over here. The purpose of this hearing is really to try to come up with solutions. Mm -hmm. No one's blaming HPD or DCP. It's just we think there might, there might be a, a, um, a hole that we're trying to fill. So why don't we make the policy that whenever these urban renewal plans are about three years out from, three years out from expiring that we engage in a Euler process to consider rezoning those areas to bring them back up to date with what we would consider today to be the modern zoning so that we, and I think the frustration over here that you're hearing from the council is the unattended consequences, right? Just to be fair, nobody's blaming, I mean, we can't blame HPD or DCP for the fact that someone owns air rights and they want to sell those and make a profit. I mean, that's essentially capitalism. We understand that. But we certainly can say, hey, there could be a mechanism that we could put in place so that when this happens, there's review. That's all we're asking. We're not saying that we're against development or against a certain kind of development. What we're saying is that we are in favor of 
public review under the Euler process, which is, I think we all agree, the gold standard of review. So would you consider coming up with uh, a plan that says that when these urban renewal plans are about to expire, let's call it three years out before they're about to expire, we engage in a Euler process to determine whether or not we need to change that zoning proactively so that we don't end up in a situation like this where we're playing catch up now on, I think what everybody agrees is a major change in the Two Bridges neighborhood of two and a half million new residential square feet. What say you, Eric? You look like you want to answer this question. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm here representing the Manhattan Office of City Planning and to speak about the questions that the council member had regarding two bridges. I can't speak for the agency as a whole. I think this is something that we can take back and discuss at city planning. Um, I Joel, do you want to speak for the agency as a whole? <laughs> Danielle, would you like to come on? <laughs> you sworn up here and uh, speak for the agency as a whole. Is that, is that something you'd like to do? <laughs> You're going to pass on that for now. You're welcome to do so. I just want to be sure that you have the opportunity. You're going to decline at this moment to. Do What's that? Well, Eric's response was that he's not prepared to discuss that. But you, as the, as the, as the official spokesperson for H for DCP, you might have uh, more light that you can shed on the subject. You're okay. You'll defer to his response. No problem. All right. Well, Jordan, good news. I know that you have the authority to speak on behalf of HPD. So let's hear it. What do you got for us on this issue? What do you think of this? You know how much more affordable? Can you imagine what we could do over here? We could create all these new units of affordable housing by just engaging in some Euler process and communities will be so happy. I mean, HPD, affordable housing is like a big part of what you do, right? A little bit, yeah. Okay, I'm just making sure that we're on the same page. Okay, so. No, I, I, we, we appreciate this idea. You know, we're, we're, we came prepared certainly on to discuss urban renewal plans and our happy to go back and discuss this new idea. I mean, this is, uh, just to be fair, staff. this is part of the urban renewal plan discussion. Okay, Th so this is a, this would be a new proposal and suggestion. It's, yeah. an, it's an interesting one. I definitely want to. No, like I said, that's have, the purpose of these hearings. Yeah. I mean, it, it would be a waste of your time and my time if we just sat and met about one particular issue and if some other issue was flagged, we said, oh my gosh, we can't. Uh, we can't uh, uh, discuss that. It would be the akin of, you know, if there was a job interview and somebody came in and said, hey, you know, are, are you good at computers? And they said, yes, I'm good at computers. Well, how are your people skills? Well, I wasn't prepared to speak about my people skills today, only about computers. Well, you know, I mean, uh, the purpose of these hearings are to explore the depth of these issues and to try to solve the problem. This, my friend, is the best of good government. We are willing to spend the time and we will hang out here all day. I think we have this room cleared until 11 p.m., so not to worry. Um, Jordan, you seem, you seem like you have something better to do between now and 11 p.m. I hope not. I'm only agreeing to do hearings with you on Fridays from now on so we can't get into the afternoons. I'm happy to do hearings on Fridays. I just won't use the microphone. And then uh, I, will gladly, I will gladly walk home. As you may know, I'm a runner, so it's not a big deal for me to walk from here uh, back to Brooklyn. My only point is that I'm not, I'm, once again, I'm not trying to put anyone on the spot. I'm really just trying to explore the issue. If you don't have a response, that's fine. We look forward to hearing the response, but this seems like this might be, you know, we're looking at different possibilities. One possibility is legislation that we've discussed today. Another possibility is changing the definition of minor modification and major modification at that. And, and the other possibility would be that we could have some sort of agreement that says that when the, I mean, I guess we could legislate it, but that just seems unnecessary. But when, when these uh, urban renewal plans expire three years before or enough time before, we can engage in a Euler process and decide whether it makes sense to rezone those neighborhoods because those goals have now been achieved and then that leads to those loopholes that I think we're all concerned about, which certainly is not of your doing and we're not blaming you for it, we're just brainstorming here with you. So, c certainly the provisions in the bill that would uh, provide for advanced notification before the plan expires would set up the opportunity for that conversation. So in, in a way the bill already starts to get there. So. See, we're doing our jobs. Excellent. I'm going to turn it over to Council Member Barron, and uh, we're going to, for non sponsors, we're going to put five minutes on the clock. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the panel for coming. Uh, and we're talking about uh, urban development sites, and we're talking about, in this case, a significant change to a development that seems to be contrary to what the intent is as we thought about urban development. 
Um, so in, in your testimony, it says, um, it is important to note that once the property is sold, there's a contractual relationship between the city and the new property owner and any successor owner. Neither the city nor the property owner may change the terms of the disposition without mutual consent. There's Livonia Commons in my district, and the developer, Dunn Development, received the uh, award, and a part of their description was that they would build along with the housing that's affordable to the people who live in my community at 30,000 AMI, that Dunn Development would build a youth center. So is that considered a part of the agreement? I'm sorry, a part of what agreement? For the development of Livonia Commons. So that, that site has yet to be conveyed. Say again? That, that particular site has yet to be conveyed. Now I'm talking about the one where they already have the housing, which was in fact designated to include a youth center. As a part of their getting the award, they said they would build a youth center. On a, the, and the youth center would be built on a different site, correct? Correct, but it's a part of that. And that the other housing is up, been up for about six years, and there's no indication at all of a youth center going up. So my question is, when developers don't fulfill their agreement, what happens to them? So it, it would depend on what the nature of not fulfilling their agreement uh, exactly is. One potential mechanism uh, is, is a reverter, that if a site has been conveyed, if it has in fact been conveyed, in this case I believe the site has not been conveyed, but if a site has been conveyed for development and that uh, site is then not developed as they had agreed to with the city, that the city has a reverter right. Right, but part of the award was that you would do that. And when you don't do that, what are the consequences? Don't just take it back. What are the consequences? And how does that impact their request to uh, do other development going forward when they haven't fulfilled their obligation? Well, I'll say from the little bit that I know about this site that, that we are um, certainly hopeful that all obligations will be met. I, I, I don't know about it in depth, and I'm happy to discuss this particular site with you. Why should we be hopeful that obligations again and will be met and not require that they be met? Why should there be a hope? We had a contract, we had an agreement. So why should we be hopeful that they will meet their obligation and not require them or impose some penalties when they don't? So I, I would say that we, 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 sh we share this disappointment there are ongoing discussions and negotiations to develop the site with community facility space as was always intended. We agree it's taking too long. And uh, So what impact does that have on that developer when he applies for other projects going forward, knowing that he did not honor what it was that he said he would do in this project? So let me answer more generally rather than uh, focusing on a specific site, that in general we look to developers' capacity to develop and to complete projects. And when they don't? That is taken into account in future awards. And how much time do you give them to complete their obligations? It, it, it depends on the site. So. So you have a challenge here in developing a community facility space, a very large community facility space, right. where a particular um, tenant was, uh, was identified right. and uh, is experiencing difficulty in completing that transaction. So we would take into account um, the, you know, the, the goodwill uh, or, or good faith, rather, that we see um, uh, by, by the property or by the developer. So, I, we, I mean, we would certainly want to see best efforts being made by the developer. If there were no efforts being made, and, the, and this uh, more of a general comment than, than this site, um, we want to see best efforts being made. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would think that we need to use stronger words than hopeful and disappointed, and we need to have some consequences. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Member. I'm going to turn it back to you, Council Member Chin. Thank you, Chair. I just want to get some clarification that the protection that was, let's say, put in place for an urban renewal plan, right, uh, uh, almost like a deed restriction or whatever, right now is, is usually there's something that, uh, it's my understanding that um, a deed or leads pursuant to an urban renewal plan if imposed at the time of disposition while the plan is in effect, you can restrict the development for 40 years from the completion of the project as opposed to 40 years from the date of the approval of the plan. Um, so the question was, why wasn't it done here? Uh, because people didn't develop. It's sort of like until the plan expire, then now they can do whatever they want. The restriction is gone. So can HPD sort of look at, you know, urban renewal sites and put in the restriction that this restriction will be for 40 years after you complete the project that you agree to? So the protection sort of stay in place and not for a developer buy the land and then sits on it until the plan expires, the restriction is gone, then he could do whatever he wants. So the, the reference to completion of the work is something that we find in urban renewal plans. Unfortunately, it is uh, a uh, well-argued, uh, uh, um, I'm going to botch the word, lit litigable. Uh, an, an item that can be litigated as to when, and that is litigated as to when completion occurs and what completion means with respect to the plan. So yes, that is something that, that could go in there, but that could also be uh, later debated as to what completion means. Meaning that the property owner would make an assertion that a completion occurred at a certain point and the city or the community might argue that completion occurred at another point and that that would have to be settled in a court. Well, I think that's why in the, in the planning process, that needs to be really clarified so that we don't have situation where people sit on, take advantage of the city, sit on the property, and then can do stuff, you know, as of right afterwards. Um, and relating to that is that when the, the Two Bridges Urban Renewal Plan expire, did HPD and DCP sort of discuss the underlying C64 zoning? Um, did they really have an opportunity to really look at it, whether that zoning was appropriate still? And at that point, you know, was there any consideration to change it? Because that C64 zoning is really usually for Midtown, you know, where you have a lot of transportation option, and that's where all the high-rise buildings are. And it shouldn't be just because it's the waterfront. I mean, you're looking at it's a working class neighborhood and it has very limited transportation option, right? The F train stop and near there is only one entrance to the subway station on Madison Street. And that's about it. And the bus service doesn't go that far, just go east and west. And there's one bus line. So transportation option is very limited. So that area, how could it really do C64 when it's supposed to be huge density like Midtown? I mean, did, were there any kind of review when it, the urban renewal plan was about to expire? Was there any kind of review that happened with HPD and, and uh, CPC? Unfortunately, that does predate both of our times at DCP and HPD. However, we can certainly go back to our records and try to investigate that further to see if that happened. Yeah, I mean, that, that would be helpful if you could go back. But right now, I mean, HPD, do you think that that zoning is appropriate for that area? We, we confer a lot with our partners at the Department of City Planning in terms of the zoning, and we're happy to have further discussions of what is appropriate or not appropriate for the, for the area. DCP, do you think is appropriate for the area? Even though I know uh, 
you talked earlier that, oh, it's near the waterfront. Well, but, but it's an area where it's limited, very limited transportation option. And then like all the buildings that was built there never were that tall to begin with. I, I understand, Council Member. The, I, I will say I'll take two different tacks. First, the, the appropriateness of the zoning that's in place now, acknowledging that it is a high-density district that is mapped there. Um, these 10 FAR districts are, are not unusual along the waterfront, including in locations that are at some distance from public transportation, sites that have been rezoned with the highest density residential districts um, for some time, and those that have been more recently mapped as well along waterfronts both on the east and the Hudson Rivers. It's, um, it's not unusual, and as Joel said, it is something that we do generally feel is appropriate to locate density and height on the waterfront. Um, in terms of the two bridges area and the, the potential effects of density here given transportation, um, I will point back to the joint environmental review that is taking place for these three developments and that transportation is one of the areas that is extensively analyzed um, as part of that environmental review process and the transportation options available through the subway and also through bus lines um, are something that you know will be analyzed and and addressed and if there are impacts that are identified then you know mitigation measures will be will be discussed as part of that process so the environmental review process that's being undertaken can speak specifically to you know these concerns that that you're highlighting regarding the high density district that's in place today um, in, in the two bridges area but I agree with what uh, Chair Greenfield talked about earlier. There's got to be a mechanism to really review um, these urban renewal sites before it expires to see if it's still, um, if this, the mission still holds, um, and to make sure that whatever is being proposed there um, is appropriate for the times. I mean, it just right now, when you look at the example in my district in this area, what's being proposed right now is just totally out of scale. And something's got to be done. I mean, like, we got to find a way to mitigate, but also to try to like, hey, stop it, uh, because it's, we cannot allow it to go forward. And I think HBD and DCP, I think you also share the responsibility with us and not just allow it to happen. If there's something can be done now to mitigate, to fix it, I mean, these tour towers cannot be coming in like that. It's one after another, right? You're talking about the Excel monstrosity that's there that created all these havoc, cracking on the streets, crack, you know, created cracks in neighboring building. And now you're going to have three more coming. It just, it just totally ridiculous and out of scale. And some things need to be done. So that's why we look towards, you know, Department of City Planning to see how you can help us. And then when we say, look, this really needs to go through a full review, then we could do something about the height, about the density, but you, the department respond back to us, minor, three minor does not equal a major, so no Euler. We don't accept that. So we're still pushing for a full review, and I think with the help of the committee and, of course, Chair Greenfield, we're going to continue to push because it just cannot happen like this. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member Chen. Thank you for your passion and advocacy for your constituents and your community. I have a couple of other related questions to this uh, particular site, then I just want to move on to one other topic. Uh, do we know what the affordability will be on these proposed development sites, the three proposed development sites and two bridges? Would uh, either one of you care to elaborate on that? To my knowledge, there is no required affordability at these sites. You know, if I was my days of, uh, of pretending to be a litigator, I was a corporate lawyer, but I like to pretend to be a litigator, I would get up now and I would yell, no required affordability. It would be a good quote for the uh, jury and for the television. Uh, speak to that. No required affordability. What's up with that? That's not very good. So explain I that for our audience at home. So those people who are watching, I always, as you know, Jordan, from watching my hearings, I am very sympathetic to those people who have insomnia and cannot sleep 
and I feel like there are not very good TV options late at night, especially on cable. You just flip through the channels, and there's nothing good. And then you see, wow, the New York City Council hearing. Now, usually those council hearings are not so riveting. I take it upon myself as the chair of the Land Use Committee to make my hearings riveting and to make it accessible to the public who is sitting there and is about to fall asleep, but I think we just woke them up when we just said no required affordability. Talk to me about that. So the only, the only mechanism via zoning to require affordability on a privately owned site is through mandatory inclusionary housing. I'll ask my colleagues to interject if I'm saying anything incorrect. So this would be a voluntary inclusionary housing. If they wanted to, they could build more, get a bonus, and in return, they could then build some affordability. Is that correct? That's, okay. cr that's correct. Dear friends, Joel and Eric, the Department of City Planning. So if the proposals are the, you know, the, the floor area on each site was to go up to 12 FAR from the, the existing 10 and then be bonused up to 12 through the voluntary inclusionary housing program, then some affordable housing would be required um, to get to that um, 12 FAR. What but kind of affordable housing? What would that requirement be? There, it, it all depends. There's different ratios and different amounts depending on if there's public subsidy or if there's not public subsidy. But generally, it's roughly 80, 80 AMI. Is that fair? Yes. Oh, yes. So it, the point is it's much more permissive, permissive than the mandatory inclusionary housing program, which would have more stringent requirements over the kind of housing that is required. Is that correct? The answer yeah, is yes. yes. And no. <laughs> I set you up, Joel. I know the answer is yes. yes. The answer is yes. It's the old, the other rule my professor at law school <laughs> taught me, don't ask a question you don't know the answer to. So I know the answer to the, to the question. I, I, think, I think you're sensing the frustration over here. This, this is exact, this is, this is really, you, you just summarized the frustration for the community. Community lives there for 50 years. You can live there your whole life. You grow up in a neighborhood. You are vaguely aware that this maybe, maybe even not, that there's something uh, called an urban renewal plan and that you are living within this urban renewal plan and you're going about living your life and you're very happy and all is wonderful and you're enjoying the sun and the street and your kids are playing and all what is this wonderful open space. And suddenly one day, bam! three huge towers fall out of the sky and pop up, which don't even require affordable housing or any amenities for the community or any consideration for the possible impact that they have on the community, I think we would agree that that is essentially a zoning loophole that someone came up with, and I'm not blaming them because this comes back to Councilmember Rosenthal's point, and there are a lot of very good lawyers in this town who come up with these loopholes and they figure out and say, hey, we could do that. And while that may be legal and permissible, and certainly I want to be clear, I'm not blaming the Department of City Planning or HPD for what is essentially a loophole in the zoning regulations. I think you can understand why that is so frustrating to us, for those of us who our job is that we are sworn to protect and to represent and to advocate for our communities, where we can't do something when literally 3,000 units are falling from the sky and you're not even going to have any affordable housing. So you could understand why that's frustrating for us and for the residents of those communities who have now have woken up, who never thought in a million years that there was going to be anything here. Suddenly, poof, there are going to be three skyscrapers in their neighborhood. Do you understand why that might be frustrating for local residents? Absolutely. And that's all we're saying. And that's, and that's really our point. Our point is that there's a problem here. We think there's a loophole over here. We think that we need to fix this loophole. The way we want to fix this loophole is through some legislation that we're discussing today, specifically this legislation that would require notice and that would actually get into the database, the possibility of looking at maybe chaining, changing the definitions of minor and major modifications, as well as the possibility of either agreeing or requiring that ULERP be engaged when these urban renewal plans actually expire, or rather before they expire. Which leads me to my final, final question for this panel of uh, the day. You folks familiar with what this is in my hands? Anybody ever see this before? This is, ladies and gentlemen, this is a atlas of urban renewal project areas. Let me tell you something. I'm very fortunate that I have an amazing, wonderful, outstanding, hardworking land use staff. God knows they spend 100 plus hours working and preparing for this hearing. This was the best they could do to find some sort of plan from HPD. It dates back to 1988 to try to figure out uh, what exactly is on the list of urban renewal projects, what is not. Do you folks keep some sort of centralized database? Can I just go to HPD and say, list of 
urban renewal project areas and something pops up? How does that work? So HPD has all the active, our active urban renewal plans electronically, internally. We Internally? Have, yes. Okay. In terms of the expired urban renewal plans, they are in, um, some of them are at HPD. Some of them are at an off-site location through a contract with DCAS. We ha are happy to share all the, ur the urban renewal plans as we did in preparation with the Land Use Committee. Um, and in terms of uh, um, all the different plans, um, we are happy to talk through with members of the public and whoever is asking about, pro about these plans. That's great, but, but you, see, you see my point here, Eunice, which is that if you are an average citizen and you actually care enough to say, hey, let me actually go see, I'm curious, do I happen to live in an urban renewal area? Might something like this happen? This, <laughs> I'm sorry, I gotta pick this up, this is just great. This, this little map with dots is essentially your guide to these neighborhoods. That's not accessible for the average person. And this just leads to the additional frustration when these local citizens in Council of Machin's district, they literally had no way of knowing this was coming down the pike. And I think that's why they're so angry and they're so frustrated, because they didn't know. It's one thing when you know something is coming, and you say, okay, listen, the zoning is what it is. There are plenty of council members out here who are going to rally and say, I don't like the zoning. Okay, you don't like the zoning, but we all know what the zoning is. That is the zoning. I have colleagues like Council Member Ben Kalos, who just wants to change the zoning, we're going to down zone. God bless him. But he knows the zoning is what it is right now. Mm -hmm. We have no idea what, what are even in these urban renewal plans. We have very difficult time, quite frankly, fighting out. And then when we find out that something that was never even in the plan was being exploited through a loophole to actually build three new super skyscrapers to get build two and a half million square feet of residential units, that is very frustrating. And that's really why we're having this hearing, because it seems to us, like in this case and other cases, there is a loophole that's being exploited by developers in the city and you seem to be doing the best that you can within the rules and regulations of what it is that you have, and we would like to give you the proper tools and the ability and pass legislation to try to prevent these loopholes, and in some cases, for example, like in this case, maybe to give you the option where you could say, you know what, this in fact would fall into a major modification, where right now it doesn't based on the way the rules are written. And that is really all that we are seeking to do here today. So I want to thank you all for coming out here today. And Jordan, not to worry, I was just joking, I was not going to keep you here till 11 p.m. It is 3.37 p.m. Plenty of time to get back to the office and work on those other important projects before the end of June. I know you've got a whole stack on your desk. And I want to thank uh, all of you who are here from the Department of City Planning, including those of you who are not testifying today, just here to observe and furious, furiously scribble notes. And the folks who are here from the HPD as well. We are grateful for your work and cooperation. And I, I said this before, I said this yesterday at a Cranes Forum, and I want to just repeat it again because I think that the, it can get lost in translation, unfortunately, when we have these hearings and we are frustrated about an issue and people think we're frustrated with individuals, and that's not true. In my experience, the uh, th three of the most professional organizations that I've worked with as a chair of the Land Use Committee have been the Department of City Planning, HPD and EDC. And your folks are consummate professionals, and you're dedicated to the work that you do, and we're grateful for all the work that you do. And we're genuinely just trying to fix what we believe is a loophole that is being exploited that really has detrimental impacts on community that couldn't even see this coming. They had no idea, and now suddenly you wake up and there are these three huge skyscrapers with 3,000 new units in your neighborhood. That's a lot. To contrast that, literally, I just want to point this out for those people who are watching at home. We will sometimes have a two-hour hearing on a sidewalk cafe. Folks, if you do not believe me, please go to the archives. We will sit there, and we will fight for two hours. For two hours, we'll have a discussion. Should there be three tables and six chairs, or should there be f two tables and four chairs? And we will go back and forth because the community is very passionate about this because sidewalk belongs to the people, and now we're taking over the public space, and we'll go back and forth, and we'll come there and we'll say, you know what? Maybe we'll give you two tables with five chairs so that three people can sit around, and we'll spend literally two hours discussing the tables and the chairs of a local sidewalk cafe at literally your local cafe. Here, we've had no conversation, no input whatsoever, no perspective, no knowledge even, and suddenly, poof, 
out from the sky will land three skyscrapers with 3,000 units and two and a half million square feet. You can understand the consternation that we have and why we believe that this is not good public policy and why we intend on working with you to change that. And we thank you for your work. We thank you for coming out here today. And we hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. And we'll now move on to our next panel. Thank you. Our next panel is uh, Paula Siegel from the Community Development Project, uh, Mara Kravitz from 596 Acres, Kathy Dang from CAAV, Jesse Nock from GOLES, and Trevor Holland, who appears to be a resident who lives in the neighborhood. Uh, this is our one and only panel, so if you have not yet signed up or if you still would like to make some comments or statements, please let the Sergeant of Arms know immediately. Uh, because this is our one panel that we are going to have public testimony from. So seeing nobody who has not signed up, we're going to continue to this panel. And um, we're going to start from right to left, my right. Ma'am, if you can just have a seat, please, if you can tell us your name and who, if anyone, you represent. And you can start with your testimony. And we are going to put uh, three minutes on the clock, uh, which is uh, actually a minute longer than we normally do, because we're running a little bit late today. We'll give you. Uh, an extra minute to testify on the issues that we are discussing here today. You may begin whenever you're ready. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Paula Siegel. I am an attorney at the Community Development Project at the Urban Justice Center. I just want to really thank Councilmember Chin and Councilmember Reynoso for introducing this bill and thank the chair for a really enjoyable afternoon. Um, this has been incredibly cathartic. Uh, I have clients that are in uh, Councilmember Chin's district who, on whose heads these, these skyscrapers are dropping. And um, before my current role at the Urban Justice Center, I have actually spent a lot of time in HPD's archives trying to understand the impacts of urban renewal plans. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, so just to introduce myself formally, I am at the new Equitable Neighborhoods Unit at the Community Development Center, the, uh, sorry, the Community Development Project. Uh, CDP works with grassroots groups, neighborhood organizations, and community coalitions to help make sure that people of color, immigrants, and other low-income residents who've built our city are not pushed out in the name of progress. Um, I will skip over the, the rest of the page. We heard a little bit, a little bit of good context about urban renewal history from HPD. And I will note that we have your testimony yeah, you in print, and yeah. it is, in fact, submitted for the record. So there's no need to go through many of Exactly. So I'm, I just want to highlight, I want to highlight a couple of things in the time that we have. Um, so just to point out, urban renewal plans are not ancient history. They are something that the city creates now. It was great to hear a commitment from HPD to work with Council Member Rosenthal to create a new plan in her district, as it seems like there's you know, development happening out of control in an urban renewal plan may be the right solution. Since the federal government defunded urban renewal programs in 1974, the city of New York adopted over 60 new plans with no federal support, and 55 of those remain active now. There is an urban renewal plan for downtown Far, for downtown Far Rockaway in Councilmember Richards District that is going through ULERP right now to give the city the powers that we've been discussing over the entirety of the redevelopment of downtown Far Rockaway. Uh, the Edgemere Urban Renewal Plan was last revised in 2008. The community has been involved in a multi-year process since Sandy to help HPD decide on what the new revision of that plan will be. That revision will be going through ULERP in 2019. The community is thrilled that HPD is, is plans to include the creation of a community land trust in that plan, but without the transparency that we're talking about today, without the enforceability that we really need, um, and without actually the city's cooperation in enforcing the reverters, which they have and they don't use, all of this is meaningless. All of this is, is just time wasted. But urban renewal is with us now. We're not just wrestling with Moses. This is the present, and it is an incredibly powerful tool. Um, you can just wrap up your remarks. Uh, thank you thank so you. much. Um, so, I have, so I think the legislation is fabulous, but I think that the way that it's drafted actually leaves a lot of gaps. And it focuses on the expiration of the plans, which is 
good, but actually doesn't give us enough information. And what should really be required is an annual report that's published for every district and for every borough that lets local elected officials know what's going on parcel by parcel with the urban renewal plans in their district. I know this is possible because I built a database like this that you can go on your computer right now and look at. It is at urbanreviewer.org. What we had to do was get access to paper records in HPD's offices and read them to make that database. We couldn't afford copies. They wanted 25 cents a page. It would have been $4,000. We would have loved to have scanned those documents and put them up online so people had them. We couldn't do it. Um, and one of the things that legislation should include is a digital repository of every plan and every revision and all of the documents that went with them. So that's my Thank happy you. to answer question. Thank you, Paula. And uh, in, in fact, we will follow up with you separately on those uh, suggestions because I don't think we need to take the public's time at this point. But we have your suggestions. We think many of them are good, and we certainly hope to follow up. And our staff will uh, reach out to you to get some or more of those uh, details. We're always looking. Part of the purpose of a hearing is not just to highlight the issues, but is also to improve the legislation and to hear from experts like you. And so we're grateful that you came out here. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Mara Kravitz, and I'm the director of partnerships at 596 Acres, which is New York City's community land access advocacy organization. Um, we champion resident stewardship of land to build more just and equitable cities. So we work with grassroots organizers and we help them transform vacant lots, mostly vacant city-owned lots, into community resources like gardens, parks, farms, and community centers, and so much more. Um, so when we work with organizers, they're often in direct conversation with urban renewal area history. It's left acres of abandoned city-owned lots in our neighborhoods. These are areas that had already suffered decades of disinvestment as a result of legally instituted racism mapped out on the Homeowners Loan Corporation's infamous red line maps. And you can look at urban renewal plans and how they overlap with those maps to see that history very clearly. So were active plans to create open space, for example, were abandoned, grassroots organizers have brought those plans to life through local planning and advocacy. By being able to reference the specific policies that have led to the, these individuals' experiences of neglect of their neighborhoods, organizers are able to work together to transform more than just vacant city-owned land, but deleterious historical practices of top-down development that have disenfranchised and disempowered the most impacted people from being able to participate in essential decisions affecting all levels of their livelihoods. So we are able to connect organizers with accurate information about urban renewal area plans because of the research that Paula mentioned doing in 2014, which culminated in urbanreviewer.org, and really in the work that um, organizers in our network do. Realizing that no such tool was made, uh, they had to go in, and you heard a bit about how they made it. Um, so this website, think, so, so the question is how will this database be used? Um, so for me as an advocate, I reference it all the time. My colleagues do, hundreds of grassroots advocates making change in their neighborhoods reference it. Um, and the site's up to date now, but there's no mechanism in place to update it as new plans are adopted and old ones expire. Um, this is because there's no centralized place for information to be regularly published. And so we're really grateful for this bill um, th because it will happily change that and fill a huge gap in public knowledge about key information. But since this is a reference tool, the bill must be amended so that the database is useful to those who are most impacted by urban renewal area planning. That is, people who live in, in or near urban renewal areas present and past. With accurate information about those plans and a vision of what's possible, these people are best poised to lead and sustain the development of their neighborhoods towards a more just and resilient city. To that end, 596 Acres recommends the following changes. First, instead of simply announcing the plan's expirations, there should be this annual reporting. And the rest of the specific recommendations you can read in my submitted written testimony. 
We got them. We will read them, and we will certainly reach out to you to review those suggestions as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mara and uh, Trevor, I guess it's you. Uh, you are Trevor, right? Yes, I am. Okay. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank the uh, <coughs> committee for listening and for quite an entertaining, entertaining afternoon. It's my first uh, meeting, and if they're all like this, I'll be back, uh, though I don't think they are. They're not all like this. <laughs> Just for the record, you're Trevor Holland, is that correct? Correct. Okay. I'm going to read a statement prepared by Cav and Goals, but I am a resident of 82 Rutgers Slip. If I walk out my door to the left, I see an 80-story building being built by Extel, along with a separate poor affordable building. If I look forward, there is a proposed 1,000-foot cantilever tower atop a senior building, and to my right, there are three proposed towers, two of them going uh, right next to affordable buildings, uh, one of them going to a building that is converting to market rate. Uh, thank you to the Land Use Committee for taking the time to review intro 1533, an important bill that the community in Chinatown and Lower East Side can speak to its significance. This statement is on the behalf of CAV, uh, organizing Asian communities in good old Lower East Side. CAV goals, and along with many other community organizations and residents, have been working specifically in, in the expired to produce URA neighborhood. We fought to preserve Pathmark on the corner of Pike Street and Cherry, one of the few affordable supermarkets in our neighborhoods. Private developer Extel had purchased land and is in the process of building a 80-story luxury building in a neighborhood where it is mostly tenement buildings and contextual affordable buildings. Adjacent to the Extel site are three plots of land where private developers, JDS, CIM, LNM, and Sturt City are trying to quietly move three minor modifications to the city, Department of City Planning. Residents are concerned that the luxury developments will, will bring, uh, residents are, are concerned that the lux, luxury developments will bring uh, distressing community construction impacts and secondary displacement. Additionally, the Lower East Side and Chinatown community was one of the hardest hit by Hurricane Sandy in 2012, and residents are also concerned about the implications of high rises on flood protections and the sewage system. In addition, Chinatown and Lower East Side have spent years in developing a thorough and inclusive, water, a thorough and inclusive community zone, rezoning plan with the Chinatown Working Group that included this waterfront. With developers moving aggressively forward before the community has, has before the community has had time to have any discussions with department city planning regarding our community plan any discussions with the department city planning now leaves out any of the proposed zoning for the waterfront all of this could have been prevented if the community had been informed and was engaged before the expiration of the two bridges uarp um, I'm going to use this last few seconds just to say that, you know, I, I, I've listened to city planning up here and give them give answers about uh, what they could have, could have done and could not have done. I still think that something can be done with regards to zoning. Um, I'm pretty active in my community, and I'm on the community board, so I've, I've seen plans and I've heard people give different solutions. Uh, and, and you highlighted a good point that there is absolutely no requirement for any developers to build any affordable housing. And if one of the goals of the city is to push affordable housing, then we need to look at legislation or some, some type of way we can get affordable housing and get these buildings to be more contextual to, to the actual neighborhood that was built. All of the buildings that are in the urban renewal air are affordable. They were built to be affordable, low and moderate income for working class and people, to, you know, to, to live there basically as a permanent home resident. And we'd like to keep it that way. Uh, so we hope that you look at this bill, but you, we, you look at other methods to see if we can do something about the current uh, development. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. I think you make an excellent point, which is that uh, the backbone of the urban renewal plans always has been affordable housing, and the fact that we're now seeing thousands of units coming up that are not affordable certainly was not the intent of this or other, uh, even as uh, Paula likes to refer to, the shiny new urban renewal plans. They're also intended to focus on affordable housing. Councilman Burchin. I just want to thank um, this panel for coming and for actively organizing. It's not a done deal, so we're going to continue to push ahead. 
because what is being posed, proposed there is unacceptable. It's out of context, you know, with the neighborhood and the spirit of what was the original urban renewal plan. So we got to work to, uh, to stop it, Chair, and I thank you for taking the lead and, and really working with us and supporting us. Councilmember Chen, it's a privilege to work with you. You're an outstanding advocate for your constituents. I know that you're going to continue to fight the fight, and I will support you along the way. I want to thank everybody who came out today, especially those who took the time to testify. We are grateful for that. The Land Use Committee for Thursday, June 15th is hereby adjourned.